letter to the Ephesians uh, from chapter 4, verse 1, and uh, we've started in that place uh, grappling with uh, living realities of following Jesus in the ordinariness of life. And some of it's been good and empowering and some of it's been challenging and hard. As part of this journey, I was encouraged by God to shift laterally across to focus on the role of the Holy Spirit in our life. And to do that, not from Ephesians, but to do that from Romans 8. Last week we finished with the command to be filled with the Holy Spirit from Ephesians 5, 18. All of Paul's ethics sort of hinge on this. Without the Holy Spirit, we have no likelihood to do what we both desire in the depths of our heart and what God desires in his quest to make us like Jesus. We struggle with those things. So we want to ask the question, how does the Holy Spirit help us? I came across a podcast from the Gospel Coalition on sanctification. Sanctification is that big theological word, that process by which we are being made like Jesus. We are being made holy to sanctify, to set apart, to make holy. God suggested to me that it would be good to talk about this before we go on to Ephesians 5 and 6, or the rest of 5 and chapter 6, because to talk about the relationships between husband and wife and parents and children and employers and employees without that understanding of God's Spirit would be to leave us without, with, without crucial information and knowledge. We would be unclear about God's commitment to us in those spaces. So the good news of sanctification, of being made like Jesus, is the good news of the coming of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father, Jesus says in Acts 1.4. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to, to Romans chapter 8. We're going to pray and read verses 1 to 11. On the slide you'll see that it says part 1. The, the rest is from chapter from verse 12 to verse 30. I wanted to do it all in one week, one hit, but it was too big, too much. And I know you love long sermons. Children's ministry love long sermons. So they can get through all of the stuff, children's ministry. I thought it was too much, so this is part one, that's part two. So let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Father, for your word. And thank you that your word is truth. You sanctify us in your word. Father, I pray, Lord, as we come under your word, we pray that its living, its life and its power would be at work in us. Father, we pray, Lord, that by your spirit you would awaken us to the realities of this passage. We need you. We have no chance without you. Come and work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, text. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what, on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. 
Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in, are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. It's an incredible passage. Yeah? It's a difficult passage. It's not an easy passage. There's a whole lot in there. We've in recent weeks been looking at the life response being made right with God through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. That is Jesus dying as our substitute and Jesus dying taking the penalty that's rightly ours. When we look at how the scriptures describe what our life should be like, what it should look like and what it should not look like, as a result of those, those things, sometimes we can be more than a little disappointed in ourselves. Sometimes the joys of being made right with God, both legally and relationally, so that he adopts us into his family by his grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, where he calls us his children. Sometimes the joy of that withers when we look at the actions and fruit of our life. Perhaps it's just me. Perhaps you guys, it's just a, a pure reflection. And it's exactly like for like. This chapter is a passage on the Holy Spirit. Romans, which is perhaps Paul's most complete theological work, uses the word spirit only five times in chapters 1 to 7. Nine times in chapters 9 to 16. But an amazing 21 times in chapter 8. If we want to know about living filled with the Holy Spirit, then this is the place. This morning we're going to look at uh, three aspects, or three sections that appear in this short passage. They sort of relate to the work of the Holy Spirit. Come first in verses 1 to 4, then verses 5 to 8, and finally verses 9 to 11. We'll then have a few concluding thoughts to close. And hopefully, hopefully God will move amongst us. As he's already been moving amongst us. And he might respond to what God's calling us into. But it just wouldn't be another thing where I fold this away and the fire attacks in my mind, never to look at it again, all right, I didn't done that. But rather, we respond to what Jesus is placing on our heart. You can sense that through prayer. Your heart for Wyala, restoring us a heart for Wyala, renewing us a heart for Wyala. In some of the prayers that we would really see our neighbour, that we would really see the people around us, the people in our families, the people who need Jesus so much. I encourage you to, uh, to respond to that today. And it's my hope that we'll gain some practical knowledge this morning, things that we might appropriate. That's a good Bible word. Not in the Bible, but it's a good theological word. Appropriate. Make ours come into our experience and our life. But uh, that means that sanctification is good news too. So, here we go. Point number one. It's a big, long point. Take up half the note space in the newsletter bit. Both justification and sanctification are grounded in the finished work of Jesus and become ours through the Holy Spirit. And we think we've known this quite clearly. But it arises strongly in this passage. The relationship between justification that we have in Christ Jesus 
and the enabling of the Holy Spirit to meet the righteous requirements of the law is introduced for us in those first four verses. Verse 1 begins with that amazing truth, doesn't it? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation was ours, though, wasn't it? It used to be ours. There used to be condemnation when we were not in Christ Jesus. It was ours through both, through both the guilt of sin and the power of sin in our life. It's the work of the preceding chapters in Romans that give us such confidence in the finished work of Jesus. There is no condemnation because through Jesus and Him alone, the law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. But what is the law of sin and death? What is the law of the spirit of life? The law of sin and death is, is that which is within people that produces sin in us. Highlights sin in us. We know sin because of the law. In fact, the more the law tells me I'm a sinner, the more I sin. I can't seem to stop it. I can't seem to help it. I become more aware of it. It's at every turn. It's like that law is operative in me to produce sin. And that sin is death. We know that it's sin that separates us from God, yeah? And God is the source of life. There is no, it's not like it leads to death eventually. The, the, the promise of God to Adam and Eve was, in the day that you eat of this, when you eat of this, you will die. Not you will die 900 years later, Adam. Death came to him then. So this, there's death in this. The law of sin and death. It operates in us. But now we are free from that law, through the operation of another law, the law of the Spirit of life. And the law of the Spirit of life is the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, that law becomes operational in us. Now the law of God, the commandment of God, is commands are good in as much as they tell us what pleases God. However, it is powerless to effect change in us. All it does is tell me that I'm a rotten, dirty sinner. Yeah? And it's always right. It's never wrong. Never makes a mistake. All it does, it seems to condemn me. Always. But God the Father has, in His Son, who is sent in the likeness of sinful flesh, He's condemned sin. He's defeated sin's power and sin's Effect its power to enslave and its guilt in Christ's being the sacrifice for sin. God the Father has condemned sin by passing judgment on it in Jesus' sacrifice. Murray, that's his surname, not his first name, Murray, one of the commentators I read, says this nice pithy statement. When the Father sent the Son, it was for the purpose of dealing with sin. When the Father sent the Son, it was for the purpose of dealing with sin. And I reckon that's really cool. Sometimes we think, oh, when the Father sent the Son, it was so I could heal the sick. Blind eyes would be open, he raised the dead. All of those things are the effect of sin. All of those things exist in our world because of sin. All of them. They didn't come about on their own. Sin brought them about. You know, what Jesus does is so much more than balancing the scales of justice in our life. It's so much more than wiping the slate clean. We can't say, Jesus wipes the slate clean. You can start again. You can't say, Jesus 
gives us a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance. She can't say Jesus gives us any chances at all. Because that's not what he's about. You're not interested in giving you a second chance. If you, if you, if you stuffed it up the first time, you will stuff it up the second time and the third time and the fourth time. Who has tried to deal with sin in their life on their own? And who's been successful? For as many times as you've tried to deal with sin on your own, you have failed. Jesus is not about giving you more chances. It's much more than that. Rather, God the Father, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, has committed himself to us. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfil his good purpose. God is at work in us to exert his will in our lives so we might be conformed to the image of his son. We might become more like Jesus. Since sin is condemned by Jesus' sacrifice and the benefits of that victory are available to the believer through the indwelling Holy Spirit who now empowers and directs believers in life, Paul can write that the righteous requirements of the law might fully be met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. But hasn't Paul just said that the law is powerless? Helpfully, Murray aids us. He says it is by the indwelling and direction of the Holy Spirit that the ordinance of the law comes to its fulfilment in the believer. And by the operations of grace, there is no antimony or contradiction between the law as demanding and the Holy Spirit as energising. But let's see what that looks like. Yeah. Let's see what that looks like. Point two. Those governed by the flesh are different than those governed by the Spirit. Again, that's like stating the obvious. My wife gave me a T-shirt on the back that says, Mr. Obvious. Because I state the obvious so often that here I go again. It should be obvious, yeah? Paul contrasts the life of one governed by the flesh with the life of one governed by the spirit in verses 5 to 8. He shows us at least four descriptors of a mind governed by the flesh. Now, mind governed by the flesh is a worldly mind. It's, it's uh, interested in worldly ambitions. It is corrupt because sin rules and reigns in it. So, firstly, the mindset on the flesh focuses on the desires and hopes of the flesh. Those governed by the Spirit have their mindset on the things of the Spirit, the things of God. The mindset on the flesh, its, it's hopes are things like to be successful, to be rich, to be beautiful, perhaps to be in love. Significant. A whole lot of things. The list is endless. That's the desire. That's what the mind is, is always on about. The mind set on the things of God. is set on his agenda. People coming to faith in Jesus. Justice, mer mercy, righteousness. Love for God, love for neighbour, love for one another. The very things we prayed about today. You know, all encapsulated in that. A heart or a mind could, uh, set on the things of God. Secondly, the mind set on the flesh is death in as much as it has no connection with God. It is separated from God and so it is a stranger to the life and peace that come from God. The mind governed by the spirit is connected to God and so is familiar with the life and peace that come from God. While the mind governed by the flesh might get spiritual feelings that we associate with a spiritual life, that we might feel good or feel spiritual. You know, I don't know how many times you feel, you know, you know when, when you hear a, a worship song, a good worship song, or you're in a space with lots of people worship, you think God must be present because of that. God's so spiritual. Feels so spiritual. You might hear a song on the radio 
and you feel spiritual. Those feelings can belong to a Christian or a non-Christian. The feelings. You know, feelings will lead us astray, won't they? Feelings will lead us wrong. But just what we want, what we desire, they're not always bad, not always wrong. But we can't set our compass by them. We're not the life that Jesus is setting aside for us. It's the life of the worldly mind. No difference, really. Life only comes by being governed by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come in any other way. Thirdly, the worldly mind is hostile to the things of God. It uh, will not submit to God and it cannot submit to God. It can't. can't do it. It does not like the law of God and sees the law as its enemy. While it might agree with God's good outcomes, it will try to get them without God. So the worldly mind may produce things that our world, our cultures might think is good, such as equality between races. That's a good thing. Our culture thinks that's a good thing. It does lots of things to try and make that happen. But it's, got, it's not the same as God wanting those things to happen. God decisively makes those things happen through Jesus. Not through trying to make us conform in some way to making this happen, which always seems to fail in people. It's like one of those balls you have. You fill them with flour, rub a, 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 a balloon, yeah? a stress ball, one of those things, you squeeze it. And if you have another ball on the outside, you've got a hole in them, and you squeeze them and, and it pops out in one spot. Yeah? If you have more than one hole, the more holes you have, the more places it pops out, and you can't seem to keep it in. You know, we, we get justice or something good happening, we squeeze on the ball, it just pops out somewhere else. Doesn't that? We feel as though we're, we're, we're getting there with, with racial equality, but we just squeeze a little and it pops out somewhere else. It may not be racial inequality, it may be sexual inequality. It may be cultural inequality. It may be a whole lot of other things. It just pops out. It pops out. The world can't change my heart. That's the trouble, isn't it? So while the agenda, while the, the desire might be the same with what God might want, it can't do it or won't do it God's way. Just because there's water in a creek doesn't mean it's fit for human consumption. Yeah. Just because the world might want something that's similar to what God wants doesn't mean we should pursue it the same way the world pursues it. Thirdly, fourthly, finally, in this point, cool. the worldly mind cannot please God. It cannot please God either by nature or by application. It's not within the capacity of the mind governed by the flesh to please God, for it never had faith in God. The essence of sin is to be against God. We might say that the mind governed by the flesh, by worldliness and the corruption of sin, is utterly depraved, utterly unable to do anything about it, even if it ever wanted to. All that requires the action of God's grace. Thirdly, those governed by the Holy Spirit have resurrection life. So in verses 9 to 11, you know, Paul is always focusing his readers in this chapter on their inability to please God. He barely goes 
a verse before reminding them that everything is empowered and enabled by the Holy Spirit through the cross of Jesus. He's always, always pointing us there. He's saying, you have nothing in yourself, it's all there. It's the only place it exists, it's there. There's nothing of us that contributes to being in Christ. Just as, as Paul has given us some characteristics of the life governed by flesh, or the mind governed by flesh, he now gives us some characteristics of the life governed by the Holy Spirit. He gives us at least uh, three. You'll probably find more because people are smarter than I am. But three, and well, then we'll be out of time anyway. Firstly, those who have the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, they belong to God. We did not always belong to Christ. There was a time when we did not belong to Christ. Rather, we were slaves of another. The friend of death. The father of lies. We were his slave. We might not have been aware of it, but we were certainly doing his bidding. And now, because of Christ Jesus' death and resurrection, and because of grace... We who have set our hope on Jesus, we who are justified, have the Holy Spirit in us. There's no other way to receive the Spirit of God, the second person of the, of the Trinity. You can't get it any other way. You don't get the Holy Spirit by singing better or nicer, coming to church more often, putting more offering in the offering bag. You don't get the Spirit of God from doing that. If that were the case, we would have no trouble, would we? Our budget would be met every week. But that's not how we receive the Holy Spirit. Only by faith in Jesus. Only by Him. If we have the Spirit, we belong to Jesus. If we belong to Jesus, we have the Spirit. Secondly, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. There's a direct connection between the life we have because of Jesus' death and resurrection and the life we can live because of the Holy Spirit. They're not causal though. They come together. Yeah? It's not causal. It's like they happen at the same time. Even though the body, that is our flesh, will die because of sin, the spirit lives, gives life because of righteousness. It's not that it's not our righteousness that is the source of the life. Rather, it's Christ's righteousness. Always Christ's righteousness. Never mine. It's an alien righteousness. We don't believe in aliens. It's not it's an righteousness that does not belong to me. It's his. I have it from him. Right standing with God, right living before God come from Jesus. We have his righteousness because, because we have his righteousness and because we have his righteousness, the Holy Spirit gives us life. But they're not causal. They, it's not like I'm righteous, then, then the Spirit comes. It's like they come together. Come together. Also note that this promise of life from the Holy Spirit is fulfilled in two ways. Firstly, by bringing into the present a portion of that which rightfully belongs to the future when Jesus will return. A portion of that comes from then and comes to us now. This is the amazing thing of the Gospel. If we lived 2,000 and a bit years ago, or 2,000 years ago, we would think that uh, we get resurrection life when we are raised from the dead, after we die, when God comes in all of his glory. Jesus comes and brings some of that into our, to our time. He comes and the good news is that 
that that which we waited for was to wait for for all that time is now coming now. We might have his life now. We might have resurrection life in part now. Ephesians 1, uh, Paul says that we have the Holy Spirit as a deposit, a down payment of what's to come in the future. It's a supernatural life. It's a life that our bodies now might live in subjection to and powered by the Holy Spirit. And secondly, more completely, this life, this resurrection life, will come completely when we are resurrected from the dead with redeemed bodies, something that Paul will expound a little later in the chapter, so we have to leave it for next week. If you really want to know, you have to come. There. Finally, the Spirit gives life to our bodies. And once again, this is in two parts, a now and a not yet. A small down payment now that assures us of what we hope for later on. And there is certainly a hope that we have concerning the future. A part of that hope is fully resurrected bodies that will be alive as Jesus is alive. We will be like him. Our love and our faith arise from this truth. And it's true because Jesus rose from the tomb. He appeared to people. He ascended into heaven, sent forth the Holy Spirit. It's true because there is resurrection life. Jesus proved that there is resurrection life. As part of that resurrection life, the Holy Spirit gives life even to our physical bodies that are subject to death. So that they can please God and bring him joy. The actions that please God are always, firstly, actions preceded by faith. That is, they arise out of faith. And secondly, they come from an existing relationship based on the work of Jesus. We do not do works that please God and then receive righteousness from him. That which pleases God in this life is always founded on a, a faith, a submitting faith. One that, that knows the power to do only as a gift from the lover of our souls. Who through the death and resurrection of Jesus has condemned sin in the flesh, exhausted his wrath towards us and called us his children. Now in a general sense we can see this in a relationship between children and their parents. When children want to please their mum or dad in general, it's not what they want to gain, it's not that they want to gain love as their reward. Rather, they want to please their parents because they love them. But they only love their parents because their parents love them first. Hopefully. That's the plan. So also with those filled with the Holy Spirit. Love, that ultimate fruit of the Spirit, shed liberally in our hearts, Paul writes in Romans 5, is the emotion and choice that drives behaviour between God and those who have his Spirit. Faith in God is working its way out through love for God and people. Concluding thoughts. What then can we say about how the Holy Spirit empowers us to live a life worthy of the calling with which we have been called? Remember Ephesians 4.1? Live a life that's worthy of the calling with which you have been called. How does the Holy Spirit help us? What, what can I say? Firstly, if you've been trying... If you've been trying to live, trying so hard to be righteous, to please God, to be perfect so that you'll be accepted by Him, please stop it. Please don't do that anymore. Change your effort. The Holy Spirit is not a tool you wield to break sin in your life. He is God. And as such, he's in control. 
Yes, he is our helper, our advocate, our counsellor, our comforter, our intercessor and our friend. But he is only those things as he is God, as he is holy, as he is all-powerful and all-knowing and a consuming fire. Have no doubt he is in charge. Secondly, if you believe in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you belong to Christ. Believing in Jesus in this way means to place your whole trust on him. Apart from him, you have nothing before God. He is your everything. He is not a tool any more than the Holy Spirit is a tool. Jesus doesn't fix your problem with the wrath of God. Or your problem with sin. Or your problem with anything. Jesus is not a handyman to fix things when they go wrong or to fix things that are wrong with you. Nor is he anything we want to make him. Jesus is God. Quit treating him like a handyman to fix your problems. If you've been using Jesus or using the Holy Spirit simply as a tool to make you better, to make you more acceptable to God, then stop it. Stop it. This passage in Romans says stop it. Stop trying to use God. Use Jesus. Use the Spirit as a tool. The Gospel is not that God through the ministry of Jesus makes bad people better. No. God is not interested in making bad people better. He's interested in making dead people alive. And isn't that the good news? That Jesus comes and he makes dead people alive. Dead people alive. The effect of using the Holy Spirit of Jesus as a tool to get better is foolishness. It's idolatry in so many ways. It's just another form of self-righteousness. Another way of getting ourselves right with God. When the truth is, without Christ Jesus, we are dead in our sins. Each and every one of us, dead. We're just taking our time to lie down. Dead people can't get better. Yeah. But faith says... I'm alive only in Christ Jesus. I'm righteous only in his righteousness. The life I have is only that which the Holy Spirit brings. If you feel as though you need someone to talk to, pray with, or whatever, if something this morning has touched you in some way that you want to, just respond to that. I'd encourage you as Cynthia comes in, and helps me by singing in tune his last song. Um, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, and we'll pray for you. And after that, we'll pray and close the service again.